I'm uh, very excited to talk here and uh, really, really get everybody hyped and pumped up to really try a little bit of uh, neutral atom technology. So it's a recent entrant on uh, the, I don't know, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the, the spectrum, right, of uh, different hardware technologies for quantum computing that are, are available. And uh, Quera is bringing uh, its own new hardware as of November. Last year, we have uh, Aquila, our machine. It's a 256 uh, quantum computer available on the Amazon Bracket cloud. So uh, we are very excited to get people you know, uh, interested in trying to, to use these machines for new calculations. So today, I'm aware that uh, this is uh, a, a, might be a new topic for many people. Neutral atom quantum technologies, as they are operated today, they they function very different from the standard uh, standard uh, quantum computers that uh, you might be using based on superconducting or or ion technologies. So we're going to have an intro here that uh, I've prepared for for you that is pretty targeted or oriented to help you get going with. Uh, uh, trying our challenge here uh, uh, for, for QHack. So for those that have never heard about neutral atom quantum processors, so they're neutral atom as in opposition to, to a, a, an ion trap, right? So the atoms, they are neutral. They have all their electrons, so we don't brush them away. We keep them where they are. And because of that, the atoms, they don't uh, repel from each other, right? So usually, charged particles, they, they have this Coulomb repulsion that uh, prevents you from, uh, uh, from, from squeezing many particles close together and also leads to a lot of uh, uh, sensitivity to stray electrostatic fields. Right? So with neutral atom quantum processors, we are using uh, neutral, completely neutral atoms. They are, can be densely packed. We can control them very efficiently uh, by using laser light, so pretty much what I mean is that uh, with a few laser uh, uh, sources, we can control many, many different atoms, which uh, is very uh, a, a very interesting property when you're thinking of a scalability, right? So that you don't have to impose uh, a lot of uh, uh, constraint on the, 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 the number of channels that you have to, con to control every single qubit that you have. And uh, uh, we also have uh, a lot of flexibility for problem encoding, as we will be discussing pretty soon, because these atoms, they live in free space. So pretty much processors can be defined by the user on, you know, on the go, and uh, which is also very different from a processor that uh, you imprint on a chip, and that once it's printed, uh, designed and printed, it's done. It's forever there. So all in all, this technology is super exciting because above everything, it leads to new ways to think quantum computing, what it is and how to do it and how to create value soon rather than having to wait for uh, universal fault tolerance uh, uh, technologies. So uh, to get started, I guess that this audience might have gone through this a few times, but we can always go uh, one less uh, or perhaps not less one. Uh, what is quantum computing? Quantum computing is not about computing faster. It's not about uh, faster clocks. It, quantum computing is about uh, newer rules, right? So you change the rules of computing, right? So what's computing? Computing is a time-dependent process where you start with an information input, you process it, you manipulate it, and then you get results. You get output from, from that calculation, right? Classically, right, the information input is done by bits and the processing is done by logic gates. So this classical logic gates that I can compose to create some logical operation on the bits and you have these results that are gonna be deterministic. Quantum, the game is completely different, right? So you start with these qubits, they don't have two values, they have like this, they're, they're analog in nature in the sense that they're continuously defined on, on a sphere, in this case, the block sphere. And the logic changes, right? So it's pretty much the, 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 the path from information input to output can be changed because the logic is different. Instead of logic gates, you use quantum gates. Quantum gates are nothing but uh, uh, unitary matrices, right? So, uh, uh, and the, the, the outcomes of this calculation is probabilistic, uh, 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 although the, the probability distributions, they are deterministic. So that's the process. And, uh, uh, 
most of what uh, you hear about quantum computing so far, uh, as of last year and this year, things are changing, is about this what we call digital operation modes, right? So the digital operations is what uh, most people here by gate based know as gate based quantum computing. So what you have here is a set of states here, your initialized states, your initialized qubits, and you're going to operate them on them via individual or two qubit gates uh, so that you can perform your operations. And uh, what um, people are doing when they're developing hardware is to create uh, uh, gates uh, uh, that are in some sense universal. So then you, 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 you collect the smallest amount of uh, different gates that are necessary so that you can cover all possible calculations or if you want all of the Hilbert space. The problem of that is that evidently uh, because of the analog nature of the qubits, they are always prone to uh, noise and uh, interactions among uh, it themselves and that makes calculations sometimes very very hard and leads to all this NISC era that we live in where the processors are noisy and they have they are intermediating scale sometimes they are tiny in scale uh, one thing that we are uh, preaching a lot about here at Quera um, and some other companies are doing as well is this idea of analog operation right so instead of doing a single qubits or two qubit gates the goal of quantum computing right the information process processing goes by having an input and simply evolving this input in time. And in quantum mechanics, this is done by, again, as I've mentioned before, a type of matrix that is a unitary, and nothing stops you from thinking of a big, large, multi-qubit gate here. So this is like a, a many, many qubit gate that you can, in principle, control continuously rather than discreetly in time, right? Discreetly as in like I have one gate, then another gate, then a third gate. So this would have like a continuous operation, a continuous uh, control over this uh, um, over this this gate. And this is an interesting idea because uh, uh, it's much more robust to errors in the sense that, uh, you know, we don't have a, 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 an error every time your, your gate was imperfect, right? You just have a single control, a single global thing. But also when you're doing, uh, for those that uh, have the experience of doing quantum simulations, uh, when you're doing quantum simulations of quantum, quantum phases or quantum states, you have to do uh, what people call trotter decompositions. And trotter decompositions by themselves, they also uh, impart errors in your system. So uh, this type of analog operation allows you to compute quantum dynamics of your, of your processor in an extremely efficient way. Right, so it's a uh, it's a very interesting operation mode. It's uh, it's uh, very easy to control because we can uh, forget about uh, doing every single operation on every single qubit and try to control qubits together and globally, and uh, really create entanglement, right, a very large entanglement over many particles in a single step instead of having to. Uh, to perform many entangling gates, uh, uh, one in sequence uh, from the other. Of course, that uh, life is not, uh, you know, uh, there's no free lunch. And uh, the reality is that uh, creating an absolutely universal uh, unitary is a very hard uh, task. So pretty much the control is, would not be as easy, it would be pretty much uh, impossible to, to do, try to, to do universally. But, sorry? Oh, yeah. Okay. So, um, given that, uh, we can uh, push in and, uh, 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 and ask, okay, what can we do other than uh, uh, you know, to, 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 to overcome these limitations of uh, universal applicability, right? So pretty much uh, if these machines are not a universal, of universal applicability, but as long as they are useful, that's a, 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 good, a good first step. Uh, we can try to mitigate that problem. That's what I'm trying to say. So what we're doing here at Quera is something that uh, uh, draws an ana analogy to, uh, to uh, FPGAs. So for those that don't know, FPGAs are, are, are embedded systems. So it's a type of uh, application-specific circuit that, uh, uh, well, it's not so specific. It's a, it's a circuit that uh, you can reprogram the connectivity of the transistors, right, the bits. Uh, to make them efficient for specific applications. 
And uh, because of that, uh, uh, those circuits, they are not so general purpose, but they are ultra efficient for, uh, for the application that you are looking for. And that's what we can do here with this neutral atom machine. So instead of, call, of uh, uh, field programmable gate arrays, as they are known, we are creating field programmable qubit arrays, so FPQ ways. And the idea is the following, right? So instead of uh, to try to mitigate this problem of universal applicability, we play with this fact that we can reposition the, uh, the, the atoms in free space and let the user define what geometry is the best for the problem that they have uh, at hand, right? So I'm pretty sure that uh, uh, many of you that have tried to code uh, uh, a gate-based device in the past might have faced a problem in which one day uh, your qubits are sitting on a brick wall or, or a square or whatever geometry it is, and that's not the geometry that you wanted. Here, with neutral atoms, we can overcome that. You can reposition the, the, the qubits the user can redefine. And while this is not going to make these machines completely universal in application, that leads to many, many possibilities, many new possibilities uh, for problem encoding. And, uh, uh, and that's very cool. Uh, and I do recommend this perspective on nature, on uh, on the importance of analog processors and, and the, 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 the chance of finding quantum advantage in the short term uh, via this, this approach. So an example of what you can do with this uh, goes as follows. All right, imagine you live in Boston. I do live in Boston. Maybe not many of you live in Boston, but I live in Boston. This could be you know, redeployed for any other, uh, uh, any other city in the world. So here in Boston, people really like Dunkin' Donuts. So if you're in Canada, maybe you like Tim Hortons. Uh, uh, so, so the question is, are there Dunkin' Donuts in every single place that I would like them to be? Right? So there might be a, 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 a best way to displace, to, to position Dunkin' Donuts stores in the city in a way that, uh, uh, that uh, they don't compete with each other, so they're not sitting too close, but they are also not so far that, uh, that, uh, that if I want to get my donuts, I, I have to walk for uh, too long, right? So what you can do with the atoms here is to literally draw a diagram here, uh, this is a graph, right? Where I'm selecting potential positions for where I would like to have Dunkin' Donuts stores. There's, they can come for many reasons, right? Uh, and the, the connections here, they represent stores that would be competing with each other. So you can see that, for example, this store and this store, they are so far from each other that there's no way they compete. So it's okay, I could, I could place a store here and a store there and be happy about it. But this store here, if I position both of them, then they would be competing for attention. And maybe perhaps I only want one of them. So what we can do with neutral atoms is literally draw uh, 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 or, or create an atomic twin of uh, this map. So the, what you are seeing the, in the figure here on the right are individual rubidium atoms positioned exactly in the structure of the map that you see here on the left. So for example, you can see here this structure, right? These three, four nodes, they represent these guys here. Right, and then you can drive them to do calculations. Pretty much, uh, you try to excite them, and uh, um, because of the physics that I'm going to tell you soon, uh, what you see is that uh, uh, the atoms that disappeared they would be the possible positions for placing Dunkin' Donuts in a way that uh, stars are not competing with each other. And then voila, you you get back to the to the optimal solution, right? So you can see that, for example, this guy here, right, uh, uh, doesn't have any neighbor that is uh, uh, red. So red is the place where I would put the store. Uh, but uh, clearly close to it, there's other stores that would cover for all the other uh, 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 potential customers, right? And this is a calculation that you can do with neutral atoms. It's a type of optimization problem that you would be very hard pressed to do uh, if you don't have enough uh, qubits and that these machines are capable of, uh, of doing in a very efficient way simply because I can position my atoms in the shape of Boston. We have done, like, we have positioned the atoms in all kinds of shapes, okay? Boston, Manhattan, uh, the, the world coast, the, the, as in little ducks, uh, little bunnies. You can, you can, you, you, you know, your mind might, like, can go wild with uh, what is an interesting shape for a, a quantum processor. Uh, and you can do things like uh, uh, 
uh, parallelizing processing. So if your calculation is, is smaller than 256 uh, atoms, you can uh, define uh, subsections, right? Divide your processor in two so that you can do cal calculations in parallel, for example. So these are very interesting uh, things that you can do just because we can move atoms around. Given that, uh, um, I'm going to take a deep breath and we will dive uh, into how neutral atom quantum computing works. So uh, qubits are encoded in rubidium atoms here at Quera. Uh, rubidium, they are alkali atoms. So they live in the beginning of your period periodic table in the first column. And uh, for all that, um, you know, purpose for all practical purposes. This means that uh, it's like a heavy, heavy hydrogen hydrogen atom, right? So it has only a single electron going about, and we can choose many different uh, uh, ways to encode information in this uh, uh, in this atom. For us, we have a ground state. The ground state, if you are okay with your uh, atomic physics, it's going to be a five S state. And our excited state, so this would be the, like the zero of your of your qubit uh, uh, register. The one state is a state that we call a Rydberg state. So it's a 7T, seven S, 7-0, seven right? So this atom that usually has angstrom size, 10 to the minus 10 meters, it increases to micrometer size. It becomes a super puffed atom that, uh, that can now interact with uh, uh, its neighboring atoms, right? And, uh, uh, and then you can use that to generate entanglement and to do calculations. Calculations, as I was saying, is just a unitary evolution. And uh, for us, that evolution is continuous. And at the end of the day, all that you need to do to know to figure out what is the, this evolution is something called a Hamiltonian. So this, this parameter that goes in the, on the top of this exponential, right? And if uh, your background is not in physics, uh, think of this as an energy cost function or rather a cost matrix, okay? Uh, uh, and that's what it is, okay? So it's just a, a, a matrix that is gonna control the energetics of your system. Okay. For us, this matrix has uh, pretty much this look, right? So I'm giving you an example for, for our uh, hexagonal lattice register here. So our, our atoms will always live in two dimensions, always in a plane. And uh, uh, we can shine some laser. It's this green shade that you are seeing. It's on the plane of the laser, right? So this light uh, is responsible for doing uh, these Rabi frequencies. So Rabi frequencies, phases, and detunings. So you see that these parameters, they don't depend on this uh, index i, right? Don't confuse with this index i. This is an imaginary number. This index i means the position of the qubit. Why? Because since the laser is shining over all atoms, all atoms are feeling the same value. Okay, all atoms are feeling the same value. And uh, so this Rabi frequency guy is like a sigma x, it's like an x gate. So it allows me to flip from the ground to the Rydberg and, and back. The phase is what can turn uh, sigma x's into sigma y's. Okay, so x gates into y gates, if you want. The detuning, so this thing is called a local, a, a, a global detuning, and uh, uh, this thing here controls the local energy and uh, uh, that uh, that that you're gonna pay for for having an excitation, right? So if if the excitation is on the ground state, you pay zero energy. If you're in the excited state, you pay one delta uh, in units of energy. Uh, 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 and you, one of delta, one unit delta of energy. So uh, this is like a, a sigma z, a, a z type of uh, a gate, except that it's global. And then finally, you have this last piece here. Okay, so this last piece is very important. Uh, you, it does not, the user does not have a control over the time dependence of it. So all of these things here, the user can define omega of t, phi of t, delta of t. This last guy uh, does not depend in time, it's constant. It's what leads to interactions and entanglement, but you can control it uh, geometrically because this parameter V uh, is a constant divided by the distance between two qubits to power six. So this means that by, by changing the position of your qubits, you can change the intensity of this, uh, of this V. 
and this V is going to never affect the the, the behavior of your system whenever uh, two qubits i and j are equal to zero. When one of them is equal to one, but the other is equal to zero, this also gives you nothing. But when both are given one, meaning both of the qubits are in the Rydberg state, you would be paying V i j in energy. Okay, and that's the, the 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 that's how you control a quantum computer, a neutral atom quantum computer today. So, time dependence of parameters, one to three parameters today, plus the geometry of the qubit register on V. And uh, uh, this this geometry uh, geometrical control is very interesting because it allows for uh, uh, several different types of uh, of uh, phenomenological uh, processes, um, including one thing that is called the Rydberg blockade. Right, so imagine I have uh, two qubits. I'm going to put a local detuning delta here just to split the, the states a little bit. So I have the ground ground. Uh, uh, then uh, with a single delta, I excite one of them to a Rydberg state. Right, So I have the ground Rydberg and the Rydberg ground. Both are degenerate with energy delta. In the Rydberg Rydberg state, so this would be like the one one state if you want. It has energy equals to delta, like two delta plus v, right? Two delta because of both each of them gives me one delta, and a v because of both of them are excited. Now, because v uh, is dependent on the distance between the qubits, if I push the qubits together, I'm pretty much squishing, right? Like I'm expelling one of the states of my Hilbert space. I'm projecting that thing out. And that's what uh, I, I meant by, by, by having stores that live too close together. Uh, only one of them I, I, I should build, right? If I have two, two sites to build a store and they, they lie too close together, I should build only one of them. And this constraint here is being implemented directly by the Rydberg blockade. Right, so pretty much I would have atoms represent star sites, and uh, an atom in the Rydberg state would be a, a, a site where I do build a star. But I cannot, if the atoms are close together, I cannot excite both of them together. And that's a big win.